And uh, I just want to put a tag on uh, about prayer. James chapter 5 says, Is any of you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Anointing them with oil, laying hands upon them, and the prayer of faith will heal the sick. So what we're going to do today after the message is I'm going to invite those of you who would like us to pray for you. Uh, Angie's here today, and some of the, our other elders, our council members are here, and we'd like to pray for you. And if you're not comfortable with us touching you, you tell us that. But we will just quickly adapt your forehead with anointing oil, just olive oil. It's not about the oil, it's the symbolism of what it represents, which is the Holy Spirit. And we want to be biblical about praying. And so there's a few people that do have some back issues, that have some other issues going on, that they need healing. Some of you have encountered and experienced some really tough stuff recently, and it's affected you physically. Uh, but if you have emotional needs, uh, whatever your need is, physical needs, let us pray for you. And let's see God work as we together join our faith and believe God and take him according to his word. Amen? Amen. All right. So let's turn it in his word this morning to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, and we are actually finishing the fourth chapter today, which means we only have chapter 5 left uh, in our study uh, in 1 John called Real or Fake. And uh, we're going to pick up today in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, and read through verse 21. I'm reading from the New International Version, if you want to follow along with me. How many of you brought your Bibles today? Hold them up. Okay, phones don't count. Sorry. Okay. We need, to, we need to see real hard copy written pages of the Bible, okay? This church is a BYOB church. What does the B stand for the last week? Yeah, very good. You got sharp. Bring your own Bible, okay? Because this tells me as your pastor that you have a Bible, number one. And it lets me think that maybe you read it. Boy, it got quiet. Uh, this is God's word. This is God's book. This is God's love letter written to us. Why wouldn't we read it? And it gives weight to his word. Yeah, so bring your Bible to church, and then uh, who knows? You might get a, a reward. I know this isn't Good News Club, but it sure works for the kids. <laughs> I also want to give recognition to the people that help us so much every week, us who, who assemble and, and sing and play. I want to, Mary Ellen, would you stand please, sis? Yeah. Let's, yeah. let's give it up for Mary Ellen. We love you and we thank you for helping us with the PowerPoint. John Cote, would you stand please? And let's recognize John at the sound. Thank you so much. doing double duty because Brian's not going to be able to, with us, to be with us for the next uh, several Sundays as he's working um, uh, away out of town. So let's just uh, always be mindful of those who faithfully uh, take care of our needs Sunday by Sunday uh, and let's thank them. Let's go to them or send them a note or something just to express that to them that they are so appreciated. First John chapter 4 verse 7 through the end of the chapter. Let's read. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Aren't you glad for that? I sure am. Verse 10, this is love. You want a definition of love? Here it is. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. And here's the extent to which he loved us. It tells us in verse 10. And send his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Our sins, your sins, my sins. What a loving God. Amen? Amen. Verse 11, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. 
No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to, the, uh, to be the Savior of the world. Verse 15. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. And this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence in the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love. Say that with me. There is no fear in love. But perfect love, the God kind of love, drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is what? A liar. a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Say that, this command. This, this, this command. command. Anyone who loves God must also love God their brother and sister. This is the word of the Lord, and may the Holy Spirit impact our hearts and our lives with it today. The title of the message today is, How is Your Love Life? How is your love life, by the way? Nora says good as she grabs the hand of her lover, her husband. I love that. Thank you, Nora. You know, that's one of the questions I often ask, like a, a friend of mine who says single, and I don't, I haven't seen him for a while, or maybe you've experienced this too, so you, you meet a, a friend, uh, and you know they're eligible. You, you know that maybe they've been eligible for a long time. And so you, the natural question comes up, right? You know, how, tell me, how's your love life? How, how's that part of your life going? And sometimes they'll, they'll kind of shirk sure, or you know, fidget and be a little awkward. Or something. Oh man, it's great. I met this great gal or I met this great guy. And, and they'll tell you and describe a little bit about the person that, that they uh, are, are falling in love with. Well, you and I know that love has many dimensions, doesn't it? There's so, love is so multidimensional. And, and, and yet we, we don't, we have a hard time describing really what love is, don't we, at times. But we sure know it when we see it, don't we? We sure know what love looks like when we watch it, when we observe it, and when it's expressed to us. I think it's interesting here to, to uh, stop for a moment and uh, consider some of the things uh, that children have said. Uh, it's, it's just so good to listen to kids sometimes, because they really become God's little interpreters for us. They have a way of taking the complex and just making it real simple and making it real, really real, don't they? And there was a panel of sociologists that Posed, several, uh, posed this question to a group of four to eight year olds. What does love mean? That was the question for these kids. And the answers they got, uh, one re researcher said, they were broader and deeper and more profound than anyone could have imagined. And that's what's true about asking kids questions like that. Chrissy, who is age six, told what love means to her. She said, love is when you go out to eat and give somebody most of your french fries without making them give you any of theirs. <laughs> Terry, four years old, said, love is what makes you smile when you're tired. Oh. Danny, age seven, says, love is when my mommy makes coffee for my daddy and she takes a sip before giving it to him <laughs> to, to make sure the taste is okay for daddy. I love it. Uh, Bobby, age five, said, Love is what's in the room with you at Christmas if you stop opening your presents and listen. Oh, wow. You can just feel that, can't you? Wow. How about Noel, age seven, said, Love is when you tell a guy you like his shirt and then he wears it every day. <laughs> <laughs> Elaine, age five, said, Love is when mommy gives daddy the best piece of chicken. 
I like this one, and if you're a dog uh, owner, you can relate. May Ann, age four, said, Love is when your puppy licks your face even after you've left him alone all day. Oh, yes. That's so true. How about this one? Uh, this is from Karen, age seven. When you love somebody, your eyelashes go up and down and little stars come out of you. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica, age seven, says, You really shouldn't say I love, I love you unless you mean it. But if you mean it, you should say it a lot because people forget. There's a lot of truth there, isn't there? Yeah. And then one more from Rebecca, age eight. She says this. When my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandpa does it all for her all the time, even when his hands have arthritis too. That's love. That's love. I well, like that for every single person that's here in this room today. You could give me a definition. You could give me some kind of description of what love means to you as I could as well. But you know, it's one thing to get a child's perspective on love. It's quite another to hear God's perspective on love, the originator of love, because God is love. Several times in Scripture, God gives us his thoughts on love. Uh, we turn back to say Song of Solomon, probably in, in some people's view, one of the more risque, uh, uh, edgy uh, books of the Bible because it talks about intimate love between a, a married husband and a wife. Uh, or 1 Corinthians 13, which we have referred to throughout our series here in 1 John, where Paul says love is patient, love is kind, God kind of love, right? The love from above, the agape love, the God kind of love uh, is, is patient, it's not rude, it's not self-seeking, it never fails, right? But here in 1 John 4, John begins to address the subject of love, and he's done this already, as we found in chapter 2. Uh, and also chapter 3, where he talks about how uh, this love shows us that we're really Christians. We're really true, real believers. And it also shows us if we're truly, really walking in the light. It, it, those people who are truly belonging to God and who walking, are walking in the light of God are going to be people who love. They love the way God loved us. Right. And yet here in this passage that we read in 1 John 4, 7-21... John gives us his most full and most complete explanation. And I think what he does in a sense through his writing here is he asks us that same question. How's your love life? How's your love life? How well are you and I doing with this thing called love and loving one another? I'm not talking about loving people in the world. That's not what this letter is for. This letter is for Christians. For brothers and sisters in Christ who, who need to learn how to love as God loves us. Amen? Amen? That's what this letter is all about. It's about really understanding the kind of quality of relationship that we should have as a church, as a family of believers, as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so, how are we changed by God's love? And how does that translate into how we live? Well, I see three ways here in this passage that we are changed by God's love. Number one, we reflect it. We reflect the love that God has for us to one another. That's the first way. And we see this throughout this whole passage, don't we? I mean, look at verse 7. Let us love one another, for love is from God. Verse 8, anyone who does not love does not know God because he is love. Verse 11, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Verse 19, we love because he first loved us. This is, this is the whole motivation for why we love one another, why we should love one another. And then, of course, the last verse is just so glaringly convicting, isn't it? Verse 21, when he says, and he has given us this what? Command. It's not an option. We don't pick and choose who we like or don't like or who we love or don't like. No, because that's not what God does with us, right? He loves us, he loves us uh, unconditionally because he's chosen to love us. And love is a choice. Anyone who's married will have to say amen to that. Because when the honeymoon wears off, 
Yeah. And we start to see, yeah, the reality kicks in about who you actually married. It's going to have, you're going to have to have a love that is more enduring and, and stronger and less fickle than your own love. Would you say amen to that? Yeah. yeah. It's going to have to be a higher love. It's going to have to be the God kind of love. That unconditional, selfless kind of committed love. And that's what he says. Anyone who loves God must also, must also, say that with me, must, must also. also love their brother and their sister. It's not, it's not an option. John says you can tell who really knows God. You can tell about someone's love life, their love for God, and their love for, for others just by watching them. By listening to them, how they talk about other brothers and sisters in Christ, how they talk about the church, how they talk about the pastor and his wife, how they talk about each other, how they talk about people, and more importantly, how they live out that love, how they act. When they call someone during the week, and they, they take our church directory, which Chris is putting together, a new one. Bless you, Chris. What a gift to our church to have that directory. Yeah. It's just around the corner. If you haven't had your picture taken, please uh, let Chris uh, take you at your best angle. <laughs> and uh, we'll get that going and get that. But boy, that directory is a wonderful tool because you can look at that directory, see a name, attach a name with a picture, a picture with the name. And you can pray for that person. But most importantly, you can tell that person how valuable they are and how much you appreciate them and how you love them. When you call them or text them or send them an email or better better yet, you know, knock on the door and leave something there. It will totally blow them away. You know, you love me that much if you make this effort to come all the way, you know, with a McDonald's cheeseburger. This is awesome. You know? <laughs> no more than that, a homemade piece of, a, a homemade loaf of bread or a pie or just something that just expresses that you're thinking of them. That's what the body of Christ should look like. Or when someone has a need in the body of Christ, we practically show, in practical ways, we show how we love God by loving one another, by showing up to help them around their house if they're not able to because they're sick or they've been injured. Or just even before you have to have a reason just to, just to kind of spontaneously, randomly call them out of the blue for no reason at all. I love it when people do that to me. And they say, hey, John, it just... I was just thinking of you. I just wanted to check in with you, bro, and see how you're doing. I want you to know how much you're loved and how much I appreciate you and I'm praying for you. In fact, is there anything I can pray for you about right now? You know, that's one of the greatest things you can do for someone. Yeah. Is pray for you. What a gift. And that's because of love. How's your love life? How's your love life? You know, it's so easy to say you love someone. Man, I've been so guilty of that. So often. Yeah, I love you, bro. Have a great week. Love you. Now, love you is really a commitment. You know that? Because th that personal pronoun is there. I. That's just kind of a, for what it's worth, they probably want me to say I love them. So I'll just, love you. <laughs> Who's loving them? I love you. And I love you because God loves you. And I love you because God commanded me to love you. I don't have a choice. That's not our prerogative to decide who, who we're going to love and who we're not going to love or how we're going to love them or if we're going to love them. Are you with me? Because the Bible says that this is how we live as Christians. This is, this is really what, what helps us know what our love life is like with Jesus and with his people. John got this when he was at Jesus teaching in John 13, verse 34, when Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you. What was that new commandment? That you love yourself more than, no, that you love one another based on just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. I'm already starting to fidget. I have to love that guy. I have to love that lady the way you love the Lord. 
I can't do that. No, you can't. That's why you need God's help. Right. You can't do it on your own. I can't do it on my own. Because there are, let's face it, there's some things about me that aren't lovely. There's some things about me, if you're really being guarded and honest with yourself, that you don't like. And that's okay. You still have to love me. Oh. <laughs> and guess what? I have to love you. Why? Because he loves you. It's a command. It's not an option. And you see, when we love one another, this is, don't miss this. When we truly love one another as God loved us, then we're reflecting that relationship that we have with him. And it shows that we've changed. It shows that love has changed us. Not going to church every Sunday. Are you with me? That's not going to change you if you refuse to love. If you refuse to love the person sitting next to you, behind you, in front of you, without showing them, in practical terms, your love for them, God's love for them. It's getting really quiet in here. Is this good? Yes. It is, because it's God's Word. It's God's Word. And we need to reflect His love. This is the first way God's love changes us. We reflect it. And we love each other. Number two, we rely on it. We rely on God's love. And we trust those eyewitnesses that had a first-hand account, first-hand experience, in person, with the God who came to love them, with Jesus himself. Can you imagine being one of the first disciples, one of the first apostles, the first eyewitness? You see, this is where our understanding of the Bible moves us into a whole new level of, of experience and relationship with the Lord. When we begin to realize that the, the man who wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and the Gospel of John actually walked with Jesus every day. That's what one of the main criteria that made you an apostle was you had to have first-hand experience, personal experience with Jesus. You had to have seen him with your eyes and touched him and felt him. And that's what makes this writing so credible, so authentic, so powerful. John was an eyewitness. He saw Jesus every day. He followed Jesus everywhere Jesus went. He, he, he helped Jesus and he walked with Jesus and he talked with Jesus. In fact, he got so close to him, it says at the Last Supper that he put his head on Jesus' chest because he loved him so much he wanted to be as close to Jesus as he possibly could. He loved him so much he didn't want anything to ever separate him from that love. You know who John was in a former life? If you know your Bible, you'll know that John, along with his brother James, were, were called something rather interesting. They were called sons of thunder. Man, that sounds like a like a movie. Yeah. And now coming to theaters everywhere. Sons of thunder. You know, it's like, who are these guys? I want to watch this. Sons of thunder. And if you're a man, you immediately would relate to that because it 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 it, it suggests action and strength and power. You know, I want to be a son of thunder. Well, why were they called sons of thunder? John, the one who wrote this letter, and his brother James, who wrote the other letter, James. Why were they called Sons of Thunder, do you think? They have big motorcycles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they made a lot of noise everywhere they went. And they did. And you know why? Because when they went to a town, or they connected with someone or met someone they didn't like, they would curse them. They would pray down God's wrath upon them. Sons of thunder, right? Well, how would you like to have a friend like that? It'd be kind of hard to get close to someone who was that honorary. Wouldn't you agree? And so he was called a son of thunder. That was his old life. That's what, how he was known. But you see, what happened in John's life is when he, he began to, to know who Jesus was. And he began to see that he was God in the flesh. God incarnate. And that Jesus had come and changed and transformed his life. His name was changed too. From son of thunder to apostle of love. 
That's who's writing this letter. That is why we can rely on what he's saying. He was there. And he experienced the power of God's love, of his transforming love in his own life. He's not just writing from his hip. He's not just writing theory here. He's writing from his own personal experience. God loves me. He knew what I was like, and he still loved me. And I'm changed because of his love. My heart is clean because of his love. Did I get it right, babe? I always get the words wrong in that song. <laughs> We're forgiven. We've been changed because of his love. Oh, man. Transformed by his love. And you see, that's the power of an eyewitness. And what's our part in all, all this? Our part is to believe it. I mean, isn't that a little bit more credible than just hearing somebody tell a story that they heard from someone else who heard the story from someone else? Right? We do that all the time. We don't check out what comes across Facebook as to its legitimacy and its authenticity and its genuineness, do we? We just, well, that really agrees with my political views, so I'm going to post it. But we don't know where that's coming from. And, and if, it, if it sounds true, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. I think we need to take time to just really be, be responsible as God's people and say, wait, before I post something which is going to reflect this relationship to somebody else and, and may or may not, you know, based on how or what I say in my post or my text or my email or my Instagram or my tweet, did I miss any of them? Probably did. <laughs> That, uh, I, what's that? Snapchat. Yeah, okay, see, I'm just so out of it, man. I'm just so not relevant. <sighs> but it can, you see what I'm saying? Is it, it can reflect whether I really love someone or whether I don't. Or if I'm just trying to beat my drum because my point of view is more important than everybody else's. Loved ones, this is the only point of view that any Christian should really be broadcasting. Because this is God's view. This is God's love. Amen. Right here. And this example that, that, that John is giving, he, 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 doesn't, he doesn't say, well, like, I was there, dude. You know, you should really listen to me. No, he just, he just spoke out of and wrote out of a relationship that he had with his Lord. And that's how we should live, too. And that's why we can rely on it. That's why we can rely on the Bible, because they were written, this Bible was written by people who knew God, who walked with Him, had a relationship with Him. No armchair theologians here, they had first-hand experience, amen? That's why we can trust the Word of God, even though it was written so long ago. That's why it's so vital and so relevant and so powerful even today. Because these words were born and written out of a relationship with a God who loved them. A God who loves us. What if what if we uh, what if we woke up tomorrow morning to the breaking news that science had found a cure to every virus known to man? I'm not just talking about coronavirus. I'm talking about every virus. What if we had that to greet us in the morning? Wouldn't that be something to cheer about? But how legitimate would it be? How really true would that statement, that, that claim be that science had found a cure for every virus? We would be grateful for the research, and we should be, the work that had been done to get to that point. But at some point, we have to realize that in this world, there is no guarantee of a full and complete cure for all viruses. Why? We're learning from the pandemic, from the virus that is active and that is uh, affecting all of our lives, that viruses mutate. Viruses mutate into other strains. And now they're talking about creating, uh, you know, manufacturing a virus that will ultimately cure every strain. Well, that's impossible because we're always trying to play catch up to the biological and, and the natural things that are in our world that we can't even see nor even really begin to comprehend and understand. See, modern medicine cannot create an immunity against the ultimate reality of death. 
caused by the virus of what? Sin. That's where Jesus comes in. That's where God's love comes in. That's right. Sin kills, and it leads to the separation of God and His love. But I've got some breaking news for you today, some great news, loved ones. Jesus' death is 100% successful in saving our lives. Amen. His blood is the antidote to the virus of sin, which should be your greatest and my greatest concern. That's right. That virus, that sin, that separates mankind from God eternally. Yes. And that's why Jesus came. To come to show us how much he loved us. And look at it again with me in verse 10. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Amen. Wow. Not just virus saving, not just sickness saving, but life saving. Yes. You can trust, you can trust this word, you can trust what God says to save you. You can trust that God loves you. And he showed the full extent of his love by sending his only son. To take the punishment for your sickness, for your greatest and my greatest sickness, the sickness of sin. He shed his precious blood, the only antidote, the only answer to our greatest dilemma of sin. He loved us that much that he took our place as an atoning sacrifice. This is love. This is love, and you can rely on it. You can rely on it. Number three, you can relax in it. You can relax in it. Isn't that a wonderful thing? That we can relax in the love of God for us and relax so much that we don't have to fear judgment. Yeah. Wow. I'd be saying you heard of that. <laughs> you remember growing up and you got into trouble with mom? And she said these words that you cringed at. Just wait until your dad goes. Right? Huh? And all day long, you know, it's like fight or flight. I'm, I'm going to pack and just run away because I don't want to deal with my dad when he gets all... Because, you know, I mean, that is just, that's fear. And in, in some ways, it's a good motivation to obey instead of disobey and reap the consequences for that. But this is the third way that we're changed by God's love. It's when we relax in his love and we no longer fear punishment. We no longer fear judgment. God love, God's love leads us to love others and leads us to trust those who wrote about it. But that's not our final goal. Look at verse 17. This is love's final goal. Do you know that love has a goal? Do you know that love has a destination? This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. By this, love is perfected with us so that we'll have confidence. This word perfected is the word used for reaching a destination. It means terminus. Have you ever ridden the bus before or the train? I would say that you probably rode a bus or a train to a certain destination, and the train or the bus was the, the means of transport that got you to your destination. Well, that's kind of what love is like with God. He's saying that this is how God's love re helps us reach the goal, how it arrives at the destination where we are going to be standing before God one day. Now, some of us right now, I can't wait for the coronavirus to be gone. Amen. We can't wait for the malls to open. We can't wait for more restaurants to open. We can't wait to start rebooking our cruises. 
You've heard that dilemma, right? Okay. You wonder why your pastor gets so wound up and so tight and nervous and stressed. It's because he hasn't had a good long vacation for a long time. Okay. And I can easily just, okay, I'm just going to frame, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to reference, I'm going to uh, align my life with the, with the terminus of the, the end of coronavirus. Well, guess what? There's going to be another crisis. That this is just the beginning. But I can, I, can I can tell you as I stand here today that the most important destination, the most important place that, that you need to be putting your priority and I need to be putting my priority is when we all stand before our Lord one day yes, at, the, at the believer's judgment. At the believer's time for testing. To see, not a, not a judgment to condemnation, not a judgment for, for like those who have rejected God at the great white throne judgment. No, this is the believer's judgment that Paul teaches us in 1 Corinthians. It's called the Venus Seat of Christ. It's, it's, it's a judgment of rewards. And, and the Bible says we're, some of us as Christians, we're going to be tested for the kind of work, for the kind of way we serve God, the kind of way we love one another when we didn't love one another. And he's going to test it by fire, it says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. To see what really lasts. And what really lasts and stands out is something we really did for God. Because we love the way God called us to love. We loved others with his kind of love. Is it, is it when that fire, that heat is turned up and the fire tests what kind of quality of work, what kind of quality of life we live with for God. Some of it's going to burn up. That's that hay wooden stubble. That's all above ground. That's that superficial stuff. That stuff that, you know, that's performance. Boy, can I relate to that at times in my life. Can I just be real with you? I don't want ever a ministry, that being, being a pastor, being called to be a pastor, to be a job. And I don't think you, as a fellow believer in Christ, want your walk with God to become like a job. Because if it is, you're not experiencing His love. You're not reflecting His love. You're not relying on His love and resting in His love. Because when the fire is tested in my life and He turns up the heat to see what kind of work I did for Him, the quality of my work, I want, a, I want something to show for it. I want precious stones, gold and silver to, to, to still be there at the end of the test. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. That's the kind of judgment. That's where we're all going to stand before God and give an account of our lives. Every one of us. That's, right. That's what the Bible says. But the beauty, the beauty of all this is that perfect love casts out any fear of that. Any fear, trepidation, apprehension of standing before God. Because right now, today, I have a, an opportunity. I can make a choice to love others the way God loved me and does love me. Perfect love casts out fear. I know that God loves me. I know that God loved me enough to send His Son to die for me. I know that Jesus took all my punishment, all my judgment upon Himself. So I have nothing to fear in the day of judgment. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm saved. Don't have to get saved again. That's not possible. I've been redeemed by His precious blood. I've been purchased. I'm His. I'm no longer my own. I no longer belong to the world or to Satan. I'm His. I belong to Him because of His great love. What He did for me by giving me and the whole world His Son. To take my judgment, to take my punishment, to be that atoning sacrifice. See, this is the thing that we need to understand. There's some really good theology here, some excellent doctrine, that uh, teaching that John is sharing with us here. When he says, and some of you have this word in your New King James or your King James Authorized Version Bible versions. This is love, verse 10, 1 John 4, 10. This is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation 
It, it's a big technical word, but it's, it's so rich with meaning because it describes for us what Jesus did. Propitiation essentially is two things in Jesus' atoning sacrifice. It's the fact that Jesus' death, Jesus' sacrifice was accepted by a holy God who could not look on sin, but his wrath and his anger burned against our sin, right? But Jesus turned away God's wrath from us and he put it on Jesus himself. That's the first part of propitiation, of, the, of Jesus being our atoning sacrifice. And the second part, the second part of his propitiation for our sins, of being the atoning sacrifice, is he not only turned God's wrath away, but he became our substitute. He became the sacrificial lamb for us. He fulfilled all the demands of a holy God. God needed to see righteousness. God needed to see sacrifice. He needed blood. And he so loved us that he sent his one and only son to shed that blood. That perfect, covering, atoning blood of Jesus to take away our sins and make us righteous and acceptable to God. Where we no longer now have to fear judgment. We no longer have to fear retribution for all the bad things we've done because Jesus took it on him there at the cross. Can you thank the Lord with me this morning? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you took my place. You loved me that much. And loved ones, we don't stop there, but we take it a step further. That same sacrificial love that Jesus demonstrated for you and for me, that God kind of love is the same love that we are commanded to show one another. Are you with me? It's not an option. It's not an option. We're commanded. We're commanded. When, when I was living at home, my mom and dad would say things and ask me to do things that I thought was absolutely absurd. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? What? Why do I have to iron my own clothes? This is absolutely ridiculous. Why are you showing me how to scrub a floor, Mom? Dad, I washed the car once already last year. Why do I have to wash the You know, all those, you know where this is going. All those things that my mom and dad taught me to do. You know what? I'm still doing them today. All those things that I just said, uh, your commands, what a joke. Sure glad I listened to them. <laughs> there is a day that goes by that Angie does not thank my mom for uh, teaching me how to take care of myself, right? How many of you have moms like that, dads like that? If you didn't, or if you don't, we got some great mentors here in this church family. I'm looking at them right now that can show you how to take care of yourself. I mean, my mom even taught me how to sew. Yeah. And I think, you know, maybe when I was at college, it was the only time I actually darned a sock. <laughs> you know, you know we fix the hole in the sock, right? Rather than throw it away like I do now and go buy another one. <laughs> and that's what you do too. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> you know you do. You know, if anyone here darns a sock, I want to talk to you like, later, okay? The only time I... The only time darn entered in is when I poke my finger with the hand. Darn. darn. But I'm still doing those same things that they taught me, and I'm so grateful. But they gave me commands. No option. You're going to take the trash out, whether you like it or not. You're going to make your bed, and you're going to clean your room, whether you like it or not. I'm so glad they persisted. Didn't make it an option because I'm doing that today. And Angie said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> Although I do have in deference to, to my sweetheart, she irons my, my shirts. <laughs> but I do know how. I just don't want to do it if I don't have to, right? Oh, 
Oh, my, where are we going with this? <laughs> oh, my word, boy, I, I just ran down a bunny trail here. <laughs> but, but we can be fearless because God's love has reached us. We can trust those who have been with Jesus and follow their writings because they're speaking from firsthand experience. And we can face the day of judgment. We can relax. We can relax with confidence, knowing he's already accepted us. He loves us. Nothing's ever going to change that. We can relax. I'm sure any of us that here today that have driver's licenses have to pass a driving test. You remember when you went to your first driving test? That was horrific. It was really hard for me because I, I went to a driving school and what kind of car did they put me in for my driving test? A one with a manual transmission. You know, they, okay, I want you to take the car, go up this hill and park it without, you know, slipping backwards. It's like, how do you do that with a clutch? Right? Needless to say, I passed the test. But nobody, nobody likes to have tests. Nobody. You know, driving's one thing when you're just driving by yourself and enjoying the, you know, the drive and going to work or heading to the store or whatever. But you have someone step into your car and sit on the other side of the passenger seat with a clipboard and starts making that sound with the pen on the paper. <laughs> I mean, don't you get nervous? Yeah. Or how about a backseat driver? <laughs> oh my God, I think that's even worse than a, an examiner. Or how about taking a test? Anybody have a test at school tomorrow, you guys? Anybody have a test this week coming up? Remember what tests were? <laughs> what, CJ? We probably have tests. Yeah, okay. Probably, but you're hoping not, right? <laughs> Nobody likes tests. Because, you know, sometimes I wasn't the best student in school, but I knew I had to study for the test because if I wanted at least to pass, forget a really good score, just to pass, to have a passing grade. It's like, I had to study. I couldn't wimp out. I had to do it. You want to pass the test that God has for you and for me? Here's what you need to do. I'm going to let you in on a secret. Actually, it's not a secret. It's right here. Love that person in front of you with God's love. Love that person sitting next to you. Love that person standing on the platform with God's love. Because I have loved you. Love that spouse. Yep. Mm -hmm. As I have loved you. And gave my life up for you. Love that child who seems to be impossible and incorrigible and you've given up on them. Love as I've loved you. That's real Christianity. That's being a real Christian. A real child of God. Not a fake one. Not a lovely man kind of person. But, say it with me. I love you. Because he loves me. I don't have an excuse. I have to love you. As we end our time today, this is God's extravagant love for us. He sent his son, his only son, to die as the atoning sacrifice, the propitiation, the substitute for our sins so we could avoid judgment. We could live in love instead of fear. So that we might live through him. He did this not only for us, but guess what? He did that for everybody in this world. Even if I happen to be married to them. They may never see the love of God. Unless they see it in me. That love that gave his all, that gave his best. For me. 
That's what the world needs. They need to see God's people loving each other. And that's how they'll know we truly are really His followers. So we can reflect that love to others. We can rely on that love because of the eyewitnesses. And we can relax even in the face of God's judgment. This is how God's love changes us. It wouldn't be love if it didn't change you. And if it doesn't change you, it's not love. Love has this transforming power, this transforming ability to change us into the people that God had, already, had always designed us to be through His Son, Jesus. This commandment we have from Him, who, this is not just from an apostle, this is not from just your dad or your mom, or a teacher or your employer, this commandment we have from the Lord, whoever loves God, must also love his brother. So let me ask you one more time. How's your love life? How's your love life? What will you do this week to show the love of God to another brother or sister in Christ? Let's pray. This is love. Not that we love God, but He loved us. He sent His Son. He loved us so much that He sent His Son to be our substitute, to take our punishment, our judgment, so that we might be accepted by a holy God, a loving God. And so we too are to show that same love, that sacrificial love. Even when it's hard, especially when it's hard. Anybody can love when it's easy. When you feel good and you've got the flutters. But we're called to a higher love than a feeling kind of love. We're called to love others the way God loves us. Unconditionally. Whether they return our love or not, that's not the point. We are expressing our love for God and what He has done for us when we love one another. And so today, Lord, as we leave this place, let us, each of us be asking that same question. How's my love life? How does my relationship with you really look to other people? How does it need to change? Oh Lord, transform me in your love. To be the, the kind of son or daughter that you are so proud to have in your family. Because we don't just say we love, we love to the fullest extent. In ourselves, we can't do this, and we admit that, Lord. That's where your transforming love comes in. Your love through us can make that difference. So help us, God, to leave this place. And even this afternoon, be reflecting on what you've showed us and told us today through your word. How can I this week express your love? Maybe to someone we, we haven't seen in our, in our gatherings for a long time. How can I reach out to them? How would you have me express your love to them? Help us to have that kind of conversation with you, Lord. And then to take that courageous step. Knowing that we can rely on your love. We can rest in your love. We can relax in your love when we reflect your love. Help us, we pray, Lord, to do what you call us to do. We need your power and your strength. Because, Lord, at the end of the day, we want to please you and make sure we're being obedient kids. 
by following through on that command. But we ask it in Jesus' name, and for his glory, and for our good, and everyone's said. Amen. Amen. Go in love. God bless you. And if you would like prayer, please come. We'll stay here for a few moments up front. If you would like prayer for something that is going on in your life, let us pray for you. God bless you.